Well, I'm Scott. I'm one of the pastors here at Marco Presbyterian Church, and you've arrived at our sermon archive page. These are sermons that are intended to be used in conjunction with your local church. We'd love for you to enjoy and to be built up in the Lord. And if you're not involved in another local church, we would love for you to plug in further right here at Marco Church. Uh, you can do that on our website, marcochurch.com, and we would love for you to participate more and more. You've arrived at the sermon series on Esther. You may ask the question, why study the book of Esther? It's a small historical book right before the book of Job, right before Psalms. And there are four quick reasons that you should study Esther. Number one is the context, because all of the Bible is about Jesus. And Esther paints a little picture of God's people in the midst of a pagan culture. And God fulfills his promises. The second reason is the characters because you know that there are multiple people throughout history who've been a part of God's work, and they are all imperfect. And that's the case with Esther and Mordecai. And uh, you want to know that, because that's a gracious way to understand that God can use you. The context, the characters, the covenant, because we see from the beginning to end that God is fulfilling His covenant promises to His people. And that includes you, if you believe in Jesus. And so we have the context, the characters, the covenant, and finally your particular calling can be clarified by looking, studying, reading, understanding better the book of Esther. That is to say that we're living in a culture that's just like where Esther lived. It's pagan, it's pluralistic, and we need to know better how to live in this moment. People who believe in Jesus and are watched over by God's sovereignty, his deliverance is still working in you and through you and you can better understand your calling right here, wherever you live. I hope you're blessed by this sermon on the book of Esther. Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Esther chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Please stand if you're able. Now in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Asuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. All the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews. For the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased, to those who hated them. In Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men and also killed Parshandatha and Dalphon and Espatha and Portha and Adalia and Aridtha and Parmashtha and Arisai and Aridai and Paisatha, the ten sons of Haman, 
the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they laid no hand on the plunder. That very day, the number of those killed in Susa, the citadel, was reported to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, In Susa, the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men, and also the ten sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your wish? It shall be granted to you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict, and let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they killed three hundred men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th day they rested and made that a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day and on the 14th and rested on the 15th day, making that a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who live in the rural towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. You may be seated. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Carolyn, for reading today, and great job again on the Ten Sons of Haman. It's nice work. We've been reading uh, the story of Esther all summer. And today is the last day of our series in the book of Esther. And so uh, what we want to see is something of a summary and uh, a sending out for the book of Esther. We loved it. It's been fun. And uh, now we're going to be moving on. And then in just a couple of weeks, beginning the book of Romans, chapters 12 to 16. Excited about that. It's a great story told of a CEO who is hired to run a family company. And so now the new CEO wants to interview the founder of the company. And so he takes a meeting, he gets a meeting with the founder and, and walks into the office. And his, his first question is, is just something like this. Hey, um, Mr. Founder, what's the secret to your long lasting year after year exceeding expectations success? And the founder just sits back in his chair and he's quite comfortable and he just says, good decisions. <laughs> and so the CEO, the new CEO, he wants to know more about how to run a great organization and how to make it successful, how to exceed expectations. And so he says, that's great, but how do you make good decisions? And the founder just sits back in his chair once again and says, experience. And so now the CEO is a little frustrated. He wants to press in a little bit further and he does. He says, okay, I understand, thank you, I've been watching for a long time and I've been learning and so a good decision's great, you get that in experience, so how do, I, how do I run the company? I wanna exceed expectations, how am I going to learn and get great experience? And the founder once again sits back and he's, he's quite comfortable to say, bad decisions. <laughs> You see, the book of Esther has been a book where we have seen the intersection. It's really the collision of the realities of the world, and it's also an exposition, an illustration of the biblical reality of this world in which we live. It is both that God is good and sovereign, 
He's ruling over all things. And he has called you and I, he's called man and woman to make good decisions, to have a will and to be faithful and to press in and live in this place that we've been called to. It's a both and. We're going to jump into the deep end, and so with your permission, as you continue to sit, sit there, if you don't run out, then I'm going to jump into the deep end as well. Are you ready for the deep end? Because what we want to do is to learn a little bit more about how to live in light of the reality that God is good, and he's sovereign, and he's called us to make faithful good decisions. And that is the story of Esther. The story of Esther, I hope it's also a part of your story. If you believe in Jesus, it is in fact your history. And Esther is the story of a people who stopped worshiping God. And so God tells his people, I am going to discipline you and I'm going to use other nations to do it. And so he does. He uses the Babylonians and the Persians and they wipe out the nation of Israel, the Jews get spread out all over the empires, and now, because that is the reality of Esther's world, she is an exile living in Susa, one of the citadels of the Persian Empire. And so God has continued to work and, in fact, answer and fulfill his promises, and he's calling us to live faithfully in the midst of them. We've read and we, we love to read, I love to read Romans, and we've read Romans chapter 8 a whole bunch of times during this series. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we love that chapter and that verse in particular because it is almost like Esther is an expansion, extension of Romans 8, 28, which says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. In that very same chapter, amen, he continues and he says, who can separate us from the love of God? He continues to answer the question. This is Paul in the book of Romans, and we've read this passage a couple of times this summer. He says this, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans 8, the very end of Romans chapter 8. And uh, what Paul is trying to do is encourage the people reading the book of Romans who are Roman Christians, and they're, they're being encouraged to walk with the Lord because nothing can separate them from the love of God. But then he continues, have you read chapter 9? He continues in chapter 9, and he, he sort of fleshes out a little bit of the reality. Maybe there are Christians sitting there saying, well, I know that bad things have happened. I know that bad things are happening to me. In fact, I live in Rome, not a great place to live as a Christian. We'll pick it up at Romans chapter 9, verse 4, which is right after a section where Paul says, basically, hey, look, the Israelites have done bad things. And even now, the Jews don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And in fact, Paul says, I would rather be cut off from God in order that my people would be able to be connected to Christ. He says, I'd rather be cut off in order that they would be connected to God. And he continues his argument saying, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, that is the Jews, according to the flesh, also Christ came, who is God over all, blessed forever and ever. Amen. But then he says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. He's continuing the argument to say, look, the Israelites walked away from God, and I would rather be cut off in order that they would be connected to Jesus, but it is true that you don't have to be of the bloodline in order to be connected to Christ. In fact, he pushes the argument all the way to its end 
with a little caveat here, and this is a, a painful verse to read if you want to flesh out history. He says this in chapter 9, verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, part of Israel's history, the scripture says to Pharaoh in verse 17, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. That is Paul reminding God's people, Christians in Rome, what God said to Pharaoh. I'm raising you up to show my glory. So how can we be connected to God? He finishes the argument in chapter 10. I hope many of you know this text. It's beginning at verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction now between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 are difficult, but they are part of God's word, and they are helping us to uncover more and more the reality that we see in the book of Esther. <coughs> Excuse me, that's the collision of God's goodness and his sovereignty right into his call for us to be wise and faithful stewards, making great decisions, being faithful right in the midst of where he's called you and me. I hope Esther is part of your story, and maybe uh, you, you might need to hear this, that Esther... She's a Jewish teenager, probably 12 or 13. She is orphaned, so her parents were killed probably by the Persians. She's adopted by her cousin, and she's just sitting in her house one day, and she is stolen from her home, and she is put into what we call today sex trafficking. She becomes a sex slave for the king for his own pleasure. She's thrown into the harem to be prepared to be maybe one of the hundreds of candidates to be the next queen. That's, that's the book of Esther. That's what we've been reading this summer. And then in an unlikely time, with an unlikely hero, in an unlikely kingdom, all of a sudden you see in, in the book of Esther a but God. He intercedes. He intervenes. He acts. Even though his people have been unfaithful, he is yet faithful. Even though they haven't fulfilled their promises, he fulfills his. And maybe just for a moment, you can step aside. Maybe that but God is for you today. Because no matter how dark the valley gets for you, there's always a but God. He has never loved you more or less. He's in fact loved you more than you can imagine. And that doesn't change whether the valley is extremely dark and it doesn't change that he's present and it doesn't change that in fact he is actively working in your life even though you and I can both proclaim Psalm 13 which says, how long will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? That's true, it can be true and God can be right there. No matter how dark your valley gets, there's still a but God. Also, in contrast, no matter what's happening to you and how high or how victorious you might feel like you are, don't forget that God is right there. He's calling you to walk in faithfulness, to obey Him, to know that He's in charge and know that you're not whole yet, but you will be. There's a both and working there as well in that if you believe in Jesus, you are right with God. You're made whole in your relationship with the Lord. But if you're still living, you're still not whole. Our bodies will break apart. Our emotions will be inaccurate. They will deceive us. And yet, you will be made whole one day. And finally, history may seem full of hopelessness. Whether you're looking at 500 BC, which is about when Esther is, 480s, 470s, or whether you're looking at 1500, which we often call 
just after the dark ages, or maybe we are looking at 1950, or maybe you're thinking about 2022, God has not changed in that entire history. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so what's our call? Well, we know that God is the ruler, and so what's our role? It is to remain faithful where he has called us, to remain faithful to him and to remain faithful in our calling. And thankfully, throughout history, God has not changed. He is the same today as he was in the day of Esther and Mordecai, two very imperfect people who God worked in and through to change the course of history, both in the mundane decisions and in the momentous decisions, both in the small things, the boring things, and in the big deals, like Esther before the king could be killed, big deals. And he has called you and I into these different moments, and thankfully, again, throughout history, God is both good and sovereign, and he's called us into that faithfulness. And Esther is a book of that collision and what we get to do today is look at chapter 9. And so right here we have the summary, basically, of the whole book in chapter 9, verse 1. On the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. Remember the great reversal or the peripatia? The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. We were at a point when we thought that all was not going to end well for the Jews but at that very moment, a great reversal happens and God intervenes and instead, the Jews gain mastery over them because God loves his people. He will make a way to rescue them. He uses these imperfect people in his perfect plan of redemption in the midst of, in this case, a pluralistic and a pagan society. But he's also doing the same thing today in a very similar society, which is both pluralistic and secular. And so what's happening right here is that we're being shown, it's sort of an illustration, the book of Esther, an illustration of what is true about who God is and who we are. In fact, maybe you're finding the same thing that I'm finding, that basically all of life is an illustration of God's character and his love for you and me. Whether it's a rock that would cry out if we didn't, which is what scripture says, or a mango, which is by itself beautiful. We can see all kinds of God's character, all kinds of pieces of God's character in his creation. In fact, we should celebrate that, and that is part of what happens in this book as well. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but the feasts are a big deal in the book of Esther. And how did we start the book of Esther? We started with two feasts. Remember, the king hosted a feast for the whole kingdom, which was six months long. And then there was another feast just for the capital or the citadel of Susa, and that lasted a whole week long. There were two feasts, one in the kingdom and one in Susa. We also know that Esther then hosts two feasts right in the middle of the book. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, how there were two feasts, but right in between the two feasts, God acted. He showed up. And it's a, a literary feature in the book of Esther that helps us to see that it actually, Esther and Mordecai, they made good decisions and they were faithful, and yet God intervened in a seemingly innocuous detail where it simply says the king couldn't sleep. That's the turning point of the entire book of Esther. It's not the faithful actions of Esther or Mordecai where the turning point happens, almost to illustrate the fact that both and are true, both God is good and sovereign, and he calls you and I, Esther and Mordecai, to step into moments both mundane and momentous, faithfully making good decisions. Both are true. So at the very beginning, there are two feasts hosted by the king. In the middle, there are two, two feasts hosted by Esther. We know the turning point in the book is right between the two feasts. And now, at the very end of the book of Esther here in chapter 9, we see the establishment of two more feasts. One is happening in the whole kingdom because in the rural parts of the, the kingdom, the battle happens. 
on the 13th and 14th and they rest on the 14th. In Susa, there are more people left who are fighting against the Jews and so they battle on the 13th and the 14th and then they rest on the 15th. There are two feasts right here at the very end and this is Purim, which is what we're going to celebrate this Friday night right here on August the 19th. You need to register, pre-register so that you can come and grab some food. And what we're going to do is we're going to celebrate this Friday and unpack some of the meaning behind this festival, this feast, which is still celebrated today, and it's called Purim. Remember in the book, and you've read some of it today, the feast of Purim, there, there really is only the explanation of what it is. And that's the most important part which is that it is celebrating God's deliverance in the midst of this exile. What's crazy about this too is that Jesus would have celebrated this feast. And so just think about it. Jesus is sitting there at the feast, the Purim, and it's named after the word for casting lots, pure. And so it's a feast that's named after essentially luck of the draw. So imagine Jesus sitting there and, you know, he's probably got buddies and family. So, hey, Jesus, you a gambler? Uh, did you buy the Roman Mega Millions ticket last month? What, what do you think about, you know, luck? Do you believe in luck? And Jesus is sitting there and I just have to imagine, uh, you know what? The creator and sustainer of all of life is yet celebrating a festival that, that actually, in fact, illustrates the deliverance of God in the midst of what we would normally call luck. I don't think Jesus actually believed in luck. I think Jesus would have said instead, you matter, history matters, your decisions matter, even the small ones, and I love you. In fact, one of my favorite commentators, uh, I've been reading her now all summer, her name is Karen Job. She says this, the book of Esther suggests that God has dignified all of history, even its seemingly most insignificant events, with his power and presence working through providence to fulfill his covenant promises. What a great statement of the reality of Esther, which is that intersection of God's sovereignty and goodness with human will, human decision-making. And because God is good and sovereign, you can be certain that you matter, that your life matters, that he continues to fulfill his promises, to, to, to in fact, make sure that his promises come true. And he's calling you in both the mundane and the momentous to be faithful stewards of what you've been given. Right into the midst of life where you may think a couple of different things. Uh, one thing that you might think, there are three different approaches to making decisions. One is called fatalism. It's kind of one end of the spectrum and I know that these are characterizations, but fatalism says something like this, I don't matter, my decisions don't matter, and my life doesn't really make an impact and so you might say something like, woe is me. And, and reading that, you, I mean, you already know that that's not true. It does matter, even some of my small decisions. And so fatalism, you can acknowledge that it's not true, and yet you and I both fall prey to this thinking, which is essentially forgetting that God is sovereign. Eh, it doesn't really matter what, what I do. It doesn't really matter who I am. And fatalism even though it's so clearly against reality, observable reality, you and I both fall prey to it. Uh, Ed and Barbara Kingsbury, they're not afraid to tell you their age, uh, which is 94 and 96. Ed is a 96-year-old man. And by the way, they've been married 73 years. Ed, talking to Pastor Steve just a couple weeks ago, said, I'm still breathing, so God's not done with me yet. What a, what a joy to hear a man who's 96 remind us 
that he is sovereign and good and our decisions still matter. He can still use us wherever we are. In fact, one of the applications of this kind of thinking fatalism would be something like this, um, prayer. I, it doesn't really matter how I pray because God's already gonna do it. Or like tell people the gospel, hey, did you, have you ever met someone named Jesus through the Bible? What, what ends up happening is that we leave those things alone and don't do them because we think, no, it doesn't matter what I do. But Charles Spurgeon, a famous preacher, said this about prayer. Prayer prompted by the Holy Spirit is the footfall of the divine decree. This is Charles Spurgeon. Prayer prompted by the Holy Spirit is the footfall of the divine decree. Your prayer matters. Talking about the hope that you have within you matters. And so fatalism is not true. Esther illustrates the fact. And yet on the other side, you could call it at least another side of the spectrum, is this idea of free will. And a free will philosophy might say something like this, I matter because I determine my destiny. And you might also say something like this, if it's, if it's to be, if it's up to me. If it's to be, it's up to me. And that's something that's very American. We're very independent. If it's to be, it's up to me. And this thinking is also, you have to confess, even reading it, I hope you see, not always true. In fact, I have to confess that I can't, in fact, control everything that happens. I hope that you can see that. You can't control everything that happens. And it's something like the opposite mistake that we fall for. Even though we can confess that it's not true, we still yet fall for it. And that is that idea that my decisions matter only because I matter. The reality is that there are a couple different ways that this plays itself out. I'm going to pick on one called the health and wealth gospel. The health and wealth gospel is a product of this kind of thinking, which is not biblical. I call it anti-biblical. Some people call it heretical, but it's this understanding or, or byproduct of this idea of free will where the shiny hope of wealth and health outshines the glory of God. And, and that plays itself out in a couple different ways. One of them, which is dangerous and I care about as a pastor, is, is people will say this. If I don't have enough faith, then I won't experience God's goodness. I won't experience God's wealth and health that he has for me. You can see these guys and girls on TV often. But thank God that that is not biblical reality. That is not the, the reality of how my faith works. In fact... The strength of my faith does not determine my reality. In fact, the strength of the object of my faith determines my reality. If it's only all about my faith and how strong my faith is, then that will fail someday. And when it does, what do you do? Well, Esther shows us that even when your faith fails, he never does. Thank God that the strength of the object of my faith is what matters, and that is Jesus Christ, Amen. who will never fail. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I know that I've been somewhat unfair with fatalism and free will, but I'm doing it to illustrate what happens in Esther to help us to see <laughs> there is, in fact, a faithful both and. And that is what Esther is. It's a faithful both and. And it says something like this. I'm, I matter because God loves me and because God is sovereign and good. I can both trust him and I am called to live faithfully in the mundane and the momentous. And you might even say something like what Philippians 4.13 says, which is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The health and wealth gospel loves this text, by the way. But if you read that Bible verse in the context of the Bible, it is the author of the same book we read earlier, Romans. It's Paul. And he's using that text right at the end of an argument where he says, you know what? I'm suffering. I want to be content, and I can only do it in the strength of my faith. No, I can only do it in Christ alone. It's a faithful both and. I matter because God created and he loves me. And because God is both sovereign and good, I can both trust him and live faithfully in the mundane and the momentous. 
Now, Tim, Tim Tebow, a football player, has made the I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, at least in this generation. He's made it more famous. He's got it on his little blackout, on his eye, on his shoes when he used to play. And I actually think Tim Tebow understands this text. It's not about you getting a touchdown. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me is not about you getting a new car. And it's not about you winning in your career. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me is to put the highlight, the spotlight on the person who matters and that person is not me or you. It's Jesus. And thankfully, that's again what Esther does. It helps us to see the book illustrates for us in real life the story, the history, that God is both good and sovereign and our decisions matter. And so thankfully, neither a, a totally fatalistic or a totally unattached free will actually exists. And said God is good and sovereign and he calls you and I to live into the midst of that and make wise decisions. Be faithful in Christ. That is our objective. And as we do that, we shine a lot on Christ who then gets the glory. And if all this is true, then let me ask this question. It, it would be maybe an application for you to think about. I hope it's a pebble in your shoe. What would you change this week and maybe moving forward if you believed that God loved you completely more than you can imagine and God was totally in control of all of history. What would you change? What would you add to your schedule? What would you take away? What would you spend more money on? What would you spend less money on? How much more would you pray because you believe that it actually matters that you pray because God loves you. He's called you to pray. He's called me to pray, but he's also in charge of all of history. And so when you pray, he's listening because Jesus died for you and for me. And the spirit is in fact communicating. He's groaning with words when we don't even know how to speak. And Jesus is in fact the intercessor. He is the mediator. He is the one speaking to his father, the true king, who will also one day host a feast for you and me. What would you change this week if you believed that God loved you and was fully in control of history? The truth is that, in fact, the feast foretells the finish. I love that there are feasts all the way through scriptures. I love that the Jewish faith, in fact, celebrates feasts. I love the reality that Revelation helps us see the end, which is a feast, and we're going to celebrate even now in the coming moments, a feast which reminds us, it illustrates for us the fact that our Savior, even on the night before he was going to die, celebrated a feast, including the guy that would betray him. Well, sitting right there. Let's pray. Our Father, we're grateful that you have given us your word, which especially in Esther has shown us many great things. And Father, we pray that they would in fact be pebbles in our shoe, that we would continue to think on them and know you more and more. And Father, would you challenge us with your truth that God, you've both been sovereign and good throughout history, a promise maker and a promise keeper. And you've also called us, your people, to walk in faithfulness in this place. Father, we love you. And we're grateful today for your word, especially in Esther. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.